exciting. Thank you very much, Lakisha. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the for the technical um, um, details that we are that we are in need of to to have this session together. But I think I'm we're all set. We're all fine to go now. And uh, it's a beautiful um, a beautiful moment to say hello to each of you. And um, hello from Bonn. Uh, I I put this screen on. This is actually the one of the one of a couple of the towers of the castle of Bonn, in which the the traditionally the the university was hosted. Um, we're not there anymore, but still, it's a nice picture, and I think it's it's good to see, it's good for you to see where we are and and from where we are located. Located in Bonn, in Germany. Uh, my name is Bert Ruben. I was uh, in nineteen in two thousand seventeen the president of the Religious Education Association. I'm a professor of religious education at the University of Bonn. Um, uh, in Europe, in Germany, and um, I would suggest that we make a very, very brief round of people in in this in this session here. Just say who you are, and is it okay that I just uh, I just uh, go through the through the through the images and and ask you to say who you are, where you're from, and then we know that we are as a global community together, which is an, uh, a very interesting experience. Yes, is that okay, Marina? Can you continue? Yes, I can continue. My name is Marina. Uh, I'm an Orthodox theologian. I'm a postdoc at the University of Bonn, located in Germany. Uh, I'm the assistant of Bert, by the way, and uh, know very well the castle behind him. And uh, I'm very grateful and happy to be Thank you, Marina. Robert. Yes, Robert Scort. And I'm from uh, Loma Linda down here in uh, Southern California. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Chantel. Hey, good evening from Cape Town, South Africa. I teach theology, practical theology at the University of Stellenbosch. Thank you. Leon. Hello, I'm a professor um, at Olivet Nazarene University outside of Chicago, Illinois. Welcome. Alan. Hi, Alan Overstreet from Anderson University School of Theology and Christian Ministry in Anderson, Indiana, which is near Indianapolis. Most welcome. Tina. Sorry, trying to unmute. <laughs> My name is Tina Drakeford. I'm um, a PhD student at St. Michael's College in the Toronto School of Theology at the University of Toronto, Canada. Hey, Tina. Russell, hi, good to see you again. Good to see you. Russell Dalton, uh, I'm at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas, USA. Thank you. Natasha. Hi, I'm Natasha. I'm an MDiv student at McMaster in Hamilton, Ontario, but uh, grew up near Freiburg in Germany. So, guten wow. Tag. Yeah, nice. Good. Uh, Mr. Bowling, or yeah, your G. Bowling. Hello, my name is Jerry Bowling. Uh, it's good to see everyone. And uh, I teach uh, undergraduates and graduate at Harvard University near Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. Nice to see you, Jerry. Matt, hey. Hi. Hi, Bert. Good to see you. Uh, Matt Hoven, religious education professor at St. Joseph's College at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. So we got at least three Canadians here. Good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mike. Yeah, Mike King, and I'm from Kansas City, president of Youth Front. Nice to see you, Mike. Beautiful. Noel. Hey, Bert. Uh, Noel Schull, a uh, retired prof in uh, religious education at Memorial University of Newfoundland, Canada. Nice <laughs> to see you all. Four of them. <laughs> okay, good. Dory, hey, good to see you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Bert. Hi, everyone. I'm Dory Baker. I'm an independent scholar, researcher, and consultant, and my home base is Lynchburg, Virginia. Beautiful. Welcome, Dory. Yeah, uh, V Stock says the, says the name. Yes, Veronica. I am oh. from uh huh. 
from Greenville, North Carolina. I am a master's of Christian education student at uh, Virginia Union in Virginia. Welcome, Veronica. Theresa, hi, good to see you again. <clears throat> Hello, Bert, good to see you too. I'm Teresa O'Keefe. I'm on faculty at the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. Right. Good. Monique, in the car. No, not in the car anymore. Well, the internet has turned down, so I, I walk out as soon as I could. But just to say hi to all of you, I'm Monique van Dijk from uh, Tilburg University in the Netherlands, and now traveling somewhere through the States from one place to the other uh, to end up in the Tosa Regional Gathering. So that's why I'm in between places. But very nice to meet you in this beautiful session. Hello. Oh, nice, Monique. Beautiful. Kathy, hello. Hello, I'm Kathy Dawson on the faculty at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, and great to see y'all. Great to see you, Kathy. Dean. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dean Blevins, Nazarene Theological Seminary. Um, I, it's good to be with you, at least partially. I'll have both my camera and my uh, microphone turned off because I'm trying to do three things at once. Long story, you can ask me about it later. So well, take care. Okay, good that you're with us. Mary, how good to see you again. Good to see you and I apologize for being late. I gather you're introducing. So Mary has uh, Luther Seminary, St. Paul, Minnesota. Wow, yeah. Good to see you again, Mary. Chris. Good morning from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, my name is Chris Miller. I work as a religious studies teacher at uh, LaSallean uh, Catholic High School in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh -huh. Okay. Welcome, Chris. Sola. Sola, can you hear us? Sorry. Yes, okay. I can. I was trying to unmute. Yes. Sorry for being a bit late. That's I am okay. Olushola Ayobiremi, Shola for short, and I lecture in the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary in Nigeria. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. Great to be beautiful. here and to be with all of you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Henry, the last one in the row. Um, Henry Zonio. I'm at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. Welcome, Henry. Okay, what a great bunch of people here in this in this uh, in this setting. We can learn so much from each other. We are focusing now on children as um, as participants in what we do, and young people as participants in our theological work. And uh, we uh, have um, an, a collaborative session prepared for today, and we have a paper by Robert Robert Skoretz prepared for today. We thought we just start with the paper of Robert. He will introduce you into paper and, and, and give you some of the headlines of it. And we have a conversation with Robert first. And then we step into the conversation with uh, Marina Kirudi, uh, Chantal Weber, and myself on uh, children as participants in theological research, which is a research project that we're working on. And we would like to have your advice on methodologies and, uh, and content elements for this research. So uh, this is actually a very, let me say, interactive session. We uh, give you some input. Uh, we help you with some uh, ideas on young people and, uh, and, their, and their ideas about uh, how, how to deal with pro-social behavior, which is actually one of the uh, issues of Robert. And then we check in with, uh, with the theme of uh, children as participants in research, how we can how we can support them and how, how we can learn from them. We want to learn as much as possible from young people and from children. That's actually also the, let me say, the central, um, the central line uh, that, we, that we have in mind for this, for this conference. And uh, I think in this session, especially, we can, we can focus on these elements. Um, Robert, could you present yourself a little bit, who you are and, um, and where you come from, and then start your presentation? Um, let me say, let, would that be possible in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then we have the conversation? Yeah? Yeah. I'll check. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert. And uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to hear all the introductions. 
My name is Robert Scortz. I teach religion to 10th and 12th grade students at Loma Linda Academy, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian school in sunny Southern California. Uh, just a shout out to uh, my man Chris there, a uh, fellow secondary uh, teacher, um, and also Matt. Um, I, I guess I can claim dual citizenship. My parents were both Canadian, uh, my mom from Alberta and my dad from Saskatchewan. So yeah, beautiful, beautiful country up there. My interest in how young people treat each other actually began during my junior year in high school. Uh, I changed from being a rather mean and sarcastic kid to actually being intentionally kind to classmates uh, outside my friend group. And kindness has continued to be a priority for me over the last 33 years in my ministry to young people. So a little more background on me, I've served as a church youth pastor, a church school religion teacher, uh, church school principal, and now I'm back in the classroom doing what I love most, teaching young people. In each context, I've sought to inspire, encourage, support teens to be for each other rather than against each other, uh, to reach out in kindness, and not just to their friends, but to those around them who might be in need. So this paper is based on my dissertation research in which I interviewed 21 students from eight Christian high schools, but excluding my own school. I did not interview my own students. I wanted to know, as a veteran educator, I wanted to know how to better empower my students to be kind. And I figured the best place to go would be to ask actual students what motivates them to be kind. Uh, the students who volunteered for the study were genuinely excited to hear that there was research being done on kindness. Uh, they really liked that their voice would be part of that process. As I started the interviews, rather than trying to ask students to talk about kindness in terms of the moral principles, I chose to start by asking them to tell personal stories where they showed kindness in action and context. It was out of these stories and conversations uh, that came observations about the spiritual and religious influence, uh, influence at work in the lives of the participants. Some of the things that those of us that work with young people in the classroom might appreciate and learn from. In my analysis of the interviews, four major themes emerged in which religious and spiritual influences contribute to adolescent pro-social cross-group interaction. You can tell why I didn't use that phrase with the students themselves. I said, let's talk about kindness. Um, those four themes are presence, modeling, resources, and education. So presence can be seen as the willingness to be with another person in a caring, attentive, and supportive role. And significant influences that I identified from the interviews um, include God's presence, adults and peers functioning as tools of God's presence and providence, and communities of faith that prioritize a comprehensive theology of presence. So one example I shared in the paper was the story of a teacher who went above and beyond the normal expectations to be present for his student. She was going through a very difficult time in her life, and that presence was both helpful and inspiring to her. And so she then made herself available to other students who were in need and provided a safe space. I love her story. It was in her car, and they could come in the car and talk about anything, and what what was said in the car stayed in the car, and she called them car talks, just kids talking to kids. She understood these acts of kindness as both the real presence of God and how God wants us to be present for each other. Um, in some of my literature review, um, I really appreciated Yong, how he challenges Christian communities to show hospitality to each other by considering that the host is hostage to the guest. That pushes me. Um, working with young people to prioritize presence in that way is not easy. Uh, it raises some interesting questions that we may want to talk about later, and I'll put all the questions in the chat um, as soon as I finish. And then I told Bert, um, whatever we want to talk, no, no, no worries one way or the other. But some questions that we might want to look at, how do we make sure our presence stays appropriate? Um, Chris, working with minors, we understand how important that line is, um, and so we've got to be careful, and yet at the same time, how can we stay open to being present for teens, for teens when it just seems safer sometimes to stay distant? 
Um, it sounds like from this particular team that I was interviewing, that kind of willingness to be present for them is a really important value. Another question would be, how can we balance accomplishment and accompaniment in an educational setting where there are such strong expectations about student performance? Um, and finally, how can we include young people in both understanding and implementing a priority of presence in a school or a church? So Bert, I love your project because that's part of what I see as a real creative way forward for young people to actually participate in understanding, participating in planning, and even implementing some of the initiatives that can make a difference for uh, their own benefit, but also the whole community. The second theme uh, in my research was modeling, and modeling can be seen as the representation of kindness in ways that are relevant, impactful, and inspiring. So significant influences I identified from the interviews include God's example, adults and peers modeling through deeds and testimonies, schools and churches modeling through religious symbolism, stories and events, and communities of faith that comprehensively integrate word and deed. One example I shared in the paper was of a student who observed that religion teachers should just talk with teens about life and kindness, almost informally as it were. She, she said it would be a way to model investment and kindness toward teens, but also to share life stories and learned wisdom. Um, she and other participants really valued teacher kindness and appreciated the testimonies that they heard by teachers and especially from classmates that showed kindness in action and real life. Uh, again, in the literature, noddings and hooks both challenge educators to model kindness and caring in all areas of education, especially in how we treat students in difficult situations. So once again, modeling kindness in everyday life is, is easy for me to talk about. Uh, it's summertime, so I don't have students in my classroom, but once they get in there and the honeymoon period of the first month is over, it's not always easy to practice. Um, and it raises some questions. Um, how can religious organizations develop cultures of kindness? And where would you start if you wanted to create change in an organization toward kindness? Um, my point of view, my, my position on this is, is somewhat unique. The school I'm teaching at is the same school I attended as a student and had my transformation toward kindness. I also have my three kids in this school. Two have graduated. The third is um, a senior this year. So I've also been an administrator here. So those are, those are different ways to see how could I impact this organization from administration, from faculty, from encouraging students, from encouraging my own kids as a parent. So where, where could we start to create change? Um, the other question that might be interesting is, I was surprised in my research uh, about how many students appreciated testimony. Maybe it's just my, my day and age or my faith tradition, but testimony was a little over the top for me. It felt a little forced. And yet the students I interviewed had opportunities to give testimony that was really well received. And um, I believe there's a lot to be, to be utilized there, but how to do so appropriately and yet preserve the authenticity uh, for students. The third theme is resources. Uh, they can be seen as elements of social capital that empower adolescents to reach out and perform acts of kindness for others. Again, especially for those outside their friend group. And significant influences identified from the interviews includes God's power, uh, everyday acts of kindness, specific resources for specific needs, and communities of faith that prioritize making social capital available and accessible to students. Another example I shared in the paper was of a student who enrolled at a Christian school while dealing with her parents' recent divorce and engaging in self-harm. She credits caring teachers and a local Christian treatment center with helping her through this difficult time. She was one of those who shared her personal testimony with the school in a chapel service and was able to help other classmates who reached out to her after they heard her story. She told me in the interview that when she arrived at this Christian campus, she felt like everyone else had perfect lives compared to hers. And yet, obviously after her testimony, with the many kids that came up to her or they DM'd her on social media, 
it showed how much pain and brokenness was actually hidden among the students. Uh, in the literature, Wolf highlights the Christian metaphor of the church as the body of Christ and in which each member is interrelated and in need of each other. Um, working at a school for so many years, by its very nature, schools market achievement. We want to, to look like we're doing things well, so it can be challenging to know how to encourage openness and vulnerability uh, in ways that enlarge opportunities for sharing resources. So students actually feel comfortable approaching resources or being resources for others. And so a couple questions that arise are, what does healthy vulnerability and interdependence look like in a school or church community? And of course, how can we get there from wherever we are on the spectrum? Um, just one more question on this section. Uh, in my paper, I mentioned a statement by Spellman regarding inclusivity. When I began my project, I was all about inclusivity. It's a great word. It, it means a lot to us. But the quote kind of set me back to reconsider how I use the word inclusive. The quote is, the power to include implies the power to exclude. Uh, one story that one of the participants mentioned was how students were initially friendly to her when she was new, but it was clear early on they didn't really want her to be part of their group. They were just being friendly. So she knew that she had no power in that group. She was not really a full member. They had the power to include her and exclude her. So uh, again, when we talk about how to involve and include students in research or even just as we teach, how can we share power um, rather than just defaulting to one-way instruction or even well-meaning, influencing, but missing maybe opportunities to share power with young people? The final theme was education. Uh, can be seen as creating a safe and inspirational space where intrinsically motivated kindness can be learned through action and reflection. Uh, significant influences from the interviews include God's guidance, pedagogy that develops the social brain, learning through experience, reflection, and leadership, and communities of faith that prioritize caring and kindness in both visible and hidden curriculum. One example I shared in the paper was of a student who suggested that religion teachers show more than tell, and allow students to experience empathy and problem solve for solutions. It was interesting because this student also shared with me how when she was growing up, her parents told her, you need to obey Jesus, and she didn't really want to. She said, uh, I don't really know this guy. Why should I have to do what, what he says, right, in the Bible? It was later as a, as a pre-adolescent when she was at several outdoor um, religious gatherings that she began to learn about Jesus's love and care experientially. Um, by the time our interview took place, she was now involved in, in peer counseling. And she said, I tell the people I, I work with, I said, I'm motivated to show kindness to you because of the, how Jesus has shown kindness to me. So she went from being told to do acts of kindness to now having um, an intrinsic motivation uh, to do so. Um, in the literature, Day's research suggests that students who learn to handle complex moral thinking are able to apply multiple perspectives and address moral dilemmas in real-life situations. And Blakemore refers to the area of the adolescent brain that deals with social functioning. You'll see it pop up now as the social brain. Um, and suggests that education should emphasize the development of this part of the brain. So this is becoming more and more of educational theory. It opens up some interesting challenges, though, for religious curriculum and pedagogy. Uh, one question in particular that kind of depends on the community that you serve in is how to engage this moral complex thinking with difficult dilemmas without stirring up the hornet's nest of concerned parents. Um, again, it depends on your community, but you may notice in the news or in your own community that uh, sometimes if you bring up a controversial issue and say, let's walk through this, uh, you have everything from parents, possibly administrators, uh, even other students who are like, hey, no, 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 let's not talk about that. Um, and of course, as a teacher, any of us who have reached a point where we're like, boy, I got to pull this back, um, we're not, we're not going to cross that boundary. We know that that's a fine line to walk as well. And yet, um, from what some of these students were telling me and, and my experience in the classroom, that moral dilemma really helps them uh, work through stuff. 
Um, and then Day's research would say that equips them to make better decisions as young adults. So in some ways, these four themes are, are not really surprising. And yet I found that hearing real life stories directly from the teens fulfills a vital need in adolescent research. Um, the narratives and observations by adolescents give, of course, a, a thick description of how they experience motivation to be kind to each other. Um, in my classroom, I continually try to listen to students and make adjustments to better facilitate learning. Even as I shared the research, as I wrote my dissertation and shared some of the observations with my students, uh, it sparked fascinating discussions. Uh, they loved hearing the stories of other students um, and it led them to some interesting conclusions and initiatives. Um, I believe that in moving forward to teach kindness in any adolescent community, we ought to listen well, share the decision-making process with teens, and intentionally encourage and support them as comprehensively as possible. So thank you very much for, for giving me some of your time. I will put the discussion questions in um, the, uh, the chat here. I'll put them one category at a time, and feel free to jump in and uh, address some of them or talk through them if you wish. Robert, thank you very much for your presentation. That was very insightful. Thank you for your, for your, uh, the, the, let me say the, 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 the report of your research and the, and the four basic clusters that came out of those interviews, uh, presence, modeling, resources, and education, which you filled with, with, with stories again, which is very, I think, very, very informative. Um, first, first question before we start the conversation, perhaps, is are there any clarification questions that you want to ask Robert first before we start into the into a, a deeper discourse on on pro social behavior, kindness, young people, and the and the role of of, of faith communities in this? Shola, please. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been quite interesting. Um, perhaps I missed it. I don't know if it's when my network fluctuated, but I was wondering how you handled ethical issues because um, in um, interviewing minors, um, was it, did you have to take permission from their parents to talk with them or was it okay because you're a school teacher? I was just wondering how you handled the ethical aspect of interviewing them. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, one of the, in, in my paper, one of the, the things I would love to do for future research is a much more expansive uh, ethnographic, multiple, uh, multiple kinds of interviews. But I had to kind of tailor uh, the work I did and the scope because of some of those restrictions. Um, I went to eight schools. I must have gone to every religion class and um, and presented, you know, kind of did my pitch. And um, I only got 21 students. And uh, part of that was just the difficulty of setting up um, the um, the notification and contract for the parents uh, that they signed and the students signed, uh, making sure they knew what kinds of questions <clears throat> I was going to ask. Uh, making sure that there were options for them at any time if they were uncomfortable to step out. Um, on the one hand, that was that was tedious for me, but working in education with minors, I appreciated it. Um, it, it protected both me and them. Uh, it also kind of made sure that those who did participate, they were quite invested. They had to go through several steps that not a lot of teens are like, you know, some of them are like, oh, that's really interesting. And then I never saw uh, any response from them. And I, I didn't even, I had to leave information for them to pick up. I didn't want to pass it out to everybody. I didn't want to make it a, a class assignment. Uh, I did not interview my own students just to protect them from feeling like, oh, I've, I've got to do this for my teacher. So yeah, uh, those, were, those were some restrictions. Um, I, I really liked, though, on the one hand, that um, the students that came were comfortable, they were ready to talk, and uh, I knew I had their parents' support, which was a good thing. Ola, is that okay? Yes, please. Thank you. Great. That's a huge, that's a huge bridge huh? from the United States to Nigeria. That's a huge one, but that beautiful that we can have this conversation like this. Beautiful. Russell, you have, a, you have also a clarification question? 
Uh, oh, not not necessarily a clarification. I, I was just going to see if this is a, a deeper dive, Robert. Uh, thank okay. you so much yeah. uh, for what you have to say. Uh, I wonder if you've drawn on other uh, resources, uh, because one of the things that struck me is, you know, in seminary, I go over the guidelines different denominations have uh, for safe sanctuaries, for safe church, uh, you know, of, of uh, making sure that there isn't abuse and that you're <clears throat> uh, following principles. I'm, I'm thinking of your first question here. here. How do you... Uh, make sure our presence stays appropriate, you know, that there's, uh, you know, for there, it tends to be that there isn't one-on-one, -on -one, you know, that there's two adults uh, present, that there's an open door, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that I, I wonder if you looked at how that might apply. And then also in my context, you know, now we're becoming increasingly aware, uh, uh, as we should have always been, of uh, accommodations offices, uh, of uh, teaching uh, trauma-informed education. And what, what strikes me is that these aren't principles just for a specific uh, minoritized group of students. Uh, these are our principles just, just that makes our education, our presence with students kinder overall uh, with all students. But I don't know if you've uh, uh, engaged those sorts of resources. Um, on the one hand, just to go back to Sola's question, um, part of the research and interview process did also include uh, being in proximity to other staff, the open door, mm, uh, right. those kind of careful things. Uh, again, those of us that teach minors, uh, those are st industry standard um, to, right. to ignore those is, is at your risk and of course, uh, we, we are all brokenhearted when we hear stories of how those are transgressed uh, on purpose. Um, but yeah, one of the questions that came up uh, as I was kind of working through my material, um, I did not expect that pretty much half of the 21 students that I interviewed had experienced uh, some kind of fairly significant social trauma that either originated in the family or originated in their own experience in say grade school um, and yet these students were able to make a, a, a growth from that position into being someone who valued uh, reaching out, not just to friends, but reaching out in kindness to, to people who were in similar situations or outside that. Um, and so that was not a significant part of where my research uh, is now, you know, where it ended. But it was something that I put down in my notes for, for further exploration, uh, especially in how we as educators, like you mentioned some of the specific programs or the specific kinds of, of training that we can do. And, and that is something that I think needs to continue. I know the school I'm at has done a couple of sessions on, on trauma-based uh, reaching out to students and knowing what to look for. Um, but it's, it's significant in that, um, one of the studies uh, that I have in my larger paper um, was looking at if, if a child who experiences trauma, especially if the antisocial experience uh, is causing them depression or anti antisocial behavior, if there's a way for that student to develop some pro-social behaviors, they tend to integrate better then and grow through and transform through the situation they're in. Uh, most of us know how devastating it is when a student does not recover or grow through that, but actually uh, regresses and goes into anti-social uh, behaviors or self-harming behaviors. And so part of that question that I would appreciate, you know, diving more deeply into is, as people who work with young people, how can we actually um, facilitate that? We can't over-facilitate it, and yet to create the safe conditions, the appropriate encouragement, and some of the, the steps to help them make those, those moves. What fascinated me was how, uh, you know, most of these students, except for the one girl who she actually checked herself into the treatment center herself. Uh, it wasn't her parents, it wasn't her school. She just said, I know I need help. And that's not always typical. But the other students, 
they tended to move forward um, finding their own way, which is, which is impressive, but we as educators would like to know how can we assist, how can we, we can do more with that. So yeah, I agree with you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Robert. Uh, in the meantime, uh, other people have joined us. Ina, I saw Ina, I saw Karen Marie, Julius and Oluva Kemi came to us. Well, we welcome in this session, dear friends. Um, we um, need to take um, care of the um, of the schedule, but still there is some time for us left. Chris has a question, and there's a question also from uh, Chantel in the chat. Uh, she asks uh, about the issue of testimony, which can be, of course, a positive way of dealing with uh, this issue of modeling. Huh? The modeling can be done in, in a context of, of negative experiences, but also in a, in a positive way. Uh, could you tell us briefly, Robert, something about how you... How you uh, envision uh, testimony in, in your work? What could yeah. that mean for the faith community? Yeah, I think initially with, there were three of the 21 participants who were asked to give a formal testimony as it were for their school's chapel service. And that was what first kind of triggered my own bias. <laughs> like, oh man, you know, what could go wrong with that, right? But in their sharing of it, it was contextualized. They had some scaffolding from either their chaplain or their religion teacher. And so there were certain um, boundaries put in place in preparation. But the fact that they were sharing part of their actual and real experience, uh, something that, that was vulnerable about them, uh, something that included God's activity in their life, uh, was what was a common common in those three situations. And in their stories, obviously, I didn't hear of however many negative ones might have happened, but in their three positive stories, um, that really made an impact on students who were in, in their student body who had remained silent up until that point. And it was when they heard from another student, oh, someone else has gone through this. Someone else has found a way you know, to heal or to move forward. I would like to talk to that person. Um, so that was kind of how they stated it. Um, a couple other students uh, talked about testimony in the sense of when I'm in class and I'm sharing personal stories as a teacher, but also when they are able to share personal stories to their class. Um, this kind of struck a chord with me because um, in these last seven years I've been back in the classroom, I've really tried to encourage storytelling, um, small group uh, discussions that allow kids to talk about life in maybe less high stakes format. Um, and, you know, sometimes kids are just shooting the breeze for whatever in the groups. And sometimes when I walk around, they're sharing some pretty significant stuff. Um, I love the presentation by Kayla uh, yesterday talking about pulpitless preaching. Uh, where are those those sacred spaces where people can talk and share? Um, this is another aspect of testimony um, that I see. Uh, my own bias from growing up in my faith tradition would be the testimony that borders on manipulative <laughs> to uh, to get people to agree with me and uh, you know in an evangelistic uh, you know st uh, uh, setting. Uh, to all of a sudden give their life to Christ because of what I've told you. And it, it can tend to be overdramatic. Um, and sometimes, uh, again, experiences I remember from my colleagues, my friends, uh, a little bit forced. And yet this was nothing like that. What these students shared was more of a real kind of authentic opportunity to share. They appreciated the chance to do that. So their impression was that it was safe to do that. And then those that responded apparently saw that authenticity and it was deeply appreciated and good stuff happened as a result. Yeah. The theme of this conference is whose children are they? Who has responsibility? So the kids themselves can have that kind of responsibility to each other eh? to tell the to tell the stories that are that are helpful in life. Chris, I come to you now in a in a last moment to this paper of Robert. You have a question? Could you? I, I could do. You... Thank you so much, Robert, for all your work. I'm sitting here thinking to myself we could talk for hours. Uh, I did my dissertation on uh, the Kairos retreat program in Catholic schools 
where the concept of testimony really you know came out. Um, but uh, I'm going to go in a different direction for my question. Uh, I really appreciated your you know focus on the inclusivity versus exclusivity, uh, and I know um, right now you know I work at a all boys Catholic high school, and uh, concepts of inclusivity and exclusivity are kind of inherent within within that. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I'm really looking at right now, in fact, I'm excited to be at Boston College next week for a class on LGBTQ ministry. Um, is that an area where, you know, I, I, I mean, both at least in, here in the United States, I would imagine, you know, throughout the world, there's certainly a lot of, um, you know, focus on uh, inclusivity around uh, or exclusivity around LGBTQ uh, ministries, transgender uh, issues. So is that an area that you looked at at all? I, it came up in the interviews. I didn't make it a specific focus, but um, in, in my faith tradition, um, LGBTQ plus uh, are not fully welcome, and they know that. Um, one of the students that I interviewed uh, that was from a school in my tradition um, shared as part of his story. Um, in, in the first part of the interview, they are telling stories of kindness. At the very end of the interview, I did ask them, uh, what do you want to tell me? What what kind of observations can you say about either barriers to showing kindness or things that you would like us in schools to do better to help you be more kind? Um, his comment was very telling. He said, um, in my religion classes, I am hearing uh, that we should be kind and that God is kind, but the treatment I'm receiving, uh, either overtly or covertly from either fellow students or sometimes administration or sometimes um, uh, teachers is not kind. Um, and so, yeah, that, that would be a huge area of um, actually listening to our young people. Um, again, depending on the tradition, um, you know, part of it is even just as a teacher in a position of, say, authority, um, how do I decenter myself enough um, to help a student feel safe? Um, just a personal story here, one of my students, not part of this research, um, I started practicing presence and just being willing to kind of hang out at lunchtime or just talk about stuff, whatever it was, the Lakers, the student loved basketball and whatnot. Um, several months later, uh, the student was comfortable enough to share with me um, their sexual orientation and their struggles uh, at my school in, in working through this. Um, it, it took quite a while to build that trust because he was used to expecting judgment, expecting some kind of theological lecture or, or even practical. Um, that kind of friendship continues on. This was a number of years ago. Uh, we meet from time to time, and he has shared with me a couple of times that just being able to affirm him as a full human being and listen, listen to him uh, without having to have comment or reaction uh, was significant for him. Uh, so part of going back to one of the themes that came up was, um, and again, it, it's, it's a thorny issue. Like if I were to turn this into a class discussion in my school, that would be problematic for my administration and for some of my parents. Um, and yet on the other hand, to practice that presence with the many students on my campus, uh, who identify that way uh, is so critical. It's it's the only place I know where to start. Um, I don't know where this will finish for, say, my school or my faith tradition, but I keep hoping that we will listen to our young people enough to let them inform us how to be present, how to be allies, how to be appropriate um, in their lives. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Again, that was another one of those things I put on the list of, okay, next steps, I'd love to, to do more in that area. Thank you very much, Robert, for, for this last observation. Yeah, really the person of the teacher in the middle, between caught in the middle, caught in the storm, so to say, between the personal experiences of young people on the one hand and the, and the tradition you call the tradition or the the institutional background in which you work as, as a school, which is, uh, which is actually the thing that that is so important in education. This is being the 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 one who is listening and the one who is, but also critically listening and perhaps also helping in changing. You call it you call it also the 
create change in in the institution in that way yeah in in newly in a new way of listening at at young people thank you very much for your presentation we take we take your questions along so if anybody of you wants to continue the conversation later with robert please write him an email or get in touch with robert huh? robert scoritz and he will he will be glad to to talk to you i think and and to learn more from you from your insights on these on these four uh, central issues in the work with young people and in the work with uh, with the development of, of pro-social behavior and kindness. Thank you very much for, for your presentation, Robert. Thank you. Now I change hats, so to say, I now I'll take over um, doing my own presentation. It's not a it's not a presentation in the in the in the traditional side, um, sense of the word. It's a it's a collaborative effort. We do this together, uh, Marina Girudi uh, of Bonn University and um, um, Chantelle Weber uh, of Stellenbosch University. Chantelle just wrote me that she has problems with her um, with her internet connection, but we try we try to do what we can. We will we will be fine. We'll get there. We start a conversation uh, uh, just briefly with uh, three powerpoints, small powerpoints. Um, a lot of information, of course, yes, but we will we will uh, we will address the central issues of this. Uh, Marina, can you can you start a PowerPoint? Is that possible? Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. Um, Chantel is hopefully with us. We will we'll see what happens. I just briefly go into the into the the presentation we call the big questions and little theologies children as participants in theological research which is a, a new project that we started at the university of bonn which we call with the acronym chapter children as participants in theological research yes marina you can show us in the next slide just briefly uh we we start from from the the the, um, the starting points that say that children are agents and children can be agents when they deal with issues of existential vulnerability. So we talk about children here and it's at the age of 10 till 12 years old. Yeah, uh, Robert was referring to young people in, the, in, in high school. We talk about uh, primary school mainly. And we also think that children can be ages in understanding the difficult issues that, um, that arise these days in, in society and in society worldwide. So we, when we talk about this, this is really a glo global issue such as think about the pandemic, think about, um, think about the issues of justice and injustice, think about, uh, about climate crisis and so on. Children are aware of what's going on and they uh, can be the agents in understanding and referring to the solutions, perhaps also to the, to the perspectives uh, of dealing with these issues. They can formulate alternative answers to the big questions is our, um, is our contention, so to say. And in the field of tension between imminence and transcendence, in the field of tension between what they experience in this world and what they hope for in a way, uh, we need teachers, and that was also what Robert was referring to, people who are modeling in a way, who are who witness, who can who can um, show the courage of their convictions to show how another world can can be can be um, can be uh, thought of and can be can be uh, realized perhaps in a way. Teachers are asked to position themselves also in this difficult uh, field of tension between what's going on and what could be the case in a more, let me say, trans transcendental perspective. We use the pedagogical concept of theologizing with children because we believe really that children are aware of um, and are able to, uh, to deal theologically with issues uh, of, of uh, contemporary society. We want to look, and that's actually the invitation to, to you or to you also to say, we want to look at collaborative approaches to do research with them, kids of 10, 12 years old. Of course, there are a lot of ethical issues like Shola already mentioned today, but what are the, let me say, what could be the, 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 the methodologies that we could use to, to, to develop um, together with them in doing this together with them, in which we could develop the ways of, of also uh, formulating with them the kind of uh, um, perspectives they have found in their own in their own in their own thinking in their own dealing with these issues and we'd like to do that in an in a sort of global classroom we attend in a global classroom the project is actually also a global project in which we invite people from many countries in the world and we want to learn what we call intercontextually from and with each other 
That's the project. It's a, it's a larger project in which we bring together already existing research in order to help, in order to understand better what's going on uh, in, the, in the life of young people and how they, and children, and how they can become the agents, so to say, the theological agents in, in dealing with these issues. We want to present some of the theoretical and empirical dimensions of the project that will be done by Chantel. And then we will focus on one possible concretization of the project done by Marina in Bonn. And then we need your input as a participant in this collaborative format. Is that okay? Yeah. Please continue the conversation, Marina, with, uh, with the slides of Chantel. I hope she can now join in. Chantel, can you, can you join in? Are you still with us? Yeah, oh, yeah, thank you. So just reflecting on some, some research that we're exploring and have done already, there's a few questions that I'd like to just pose and, and highlight when we consider doing empirical work with, with children. So looking at one specific theme of sexual violence within the South African context against children and youth, um, we were asking questions around what the role of congregations or faith communities are in protecting these young people and very quickly realized that language within congregations needs to be unpacked, needs to be uh, reconsidered. Uh, and specifically within this, the, the topic of sexual violence, we need to reconsider, you know, even uh, the, the place or the understanding we have around God images. So what is a child who has gone through um, sexual trauma, what is their image of God, what is their perception of God, and so when we use examples of, you know, God as father within these contexts, um, what, what are we saying, so language, uh, theological, you know, Christianese um, can quite become quite problematic in, in situations like this, so in this instance, we're asking the question around, what are the God images of of young children who are growing up in traumatized uh, contexts. And in our South African context specifically, most sexual trauma uh, is connected to uh, trauma within the home. Uh, maybe a father figure or uncle or, or mother figure or so forth. So it's not a stranger. Thank you, Marina. We also uh, explored, uh, some of us will be familiar with what we call the praxis cycle. It's a missiological, uh, methodology. Here we were looking at what does it mean to do theology with children? So one of the theoretical plays we constantly would be going up against is this notion of with children, for children, alongside children. And it's already questions around the difference between children's ministry and child theology, for example, come to play. In this specific um, uh, project, we were looking at what it means for us to really engage with children as collaborators in an intergenerational context. And so you'll see there, we, we, we try to explore things like the praxis cycle, where children are inserted and immersed in their own context. And so how do we then unpack their own spirituality and lived experiences of faith as we journey alongside them? And to complexify that even more, how do we then reflect with them in an intergenerational context? And so some of the questions we ask in this instance is what does it mean to really do theology with the child that is fully immersed in their own context? And us too, uh, and as Robert was saying, just really being cautious around uh, relationships of power and bias. Thanks, Marina. Maybe just to consider our recent uh, uh, reflections on a thematic area such as COVID-19. I'm sure many of us have engaged with this as a possibility for exploring what is the place of children when we do research uh, in such a complex uh, and traumatic context. And, and yeah, uh, the sad reality, of course, in our, in our research was that, yeah, children were not seen to immediately children were not taken care of within congregations in terms of ministry. Uh, it was the adults that were seen to first. Um, what happens in cases like this when we speak about pastoral care alongside children? Uh, what does it uh, mean for us to explore the child's voice in experiencing pastoral care from the child's perspective? So looking at, at those endeavors, but then also 
the child's own digital abilities during the pandemic. Children were more equipped to use the digital media we were promoting in many contexts, but we didn't call on them to guide us through the process. We catered for the adults who had the devices and access to the devices, but we didn't consult children who really most likely would be able to teach us much more on how to use these devices. So how do we even think about children within these global you know, uh, or localized context as well and what they are truly capable of. Thanks, Marina. And then lastly, just a recent exploration. Uh, some of you will know the Langham Publications and also the Viva Network has brought out a book called God's Heart for Children. It's a sequel to Understanding God's Heart for Children. Here we were asking some questions around who is affirmed in God's church? Um, are children including in that, included in that affirmation? And specifically interrogating the notion of what does it mean to go beyond welcoming children, creating space for them, which many of us would say we, we've done okay with, but to actually engaging these children intentionally in, in the notion of asking them. So you see a lot of the language we are trying to explore in this project has to do with, yeah, we've made space at the table, we've made lovely venues accessible to kids, but what does it mean to go beyond that to actually engage in children within kingdom theology, for example? Thanks, Marina. And then uh, I just put out two, two other recent uh, works from, from South Africa. Um, We've got a, a local minister who's doing a PhD in theology asking the question, what does it mean to teach the gospel in an African context through the eyes of the child? Um, and if you know anything about the African context, you know that the notion of child is also contested. When are you a child uh, is really culturally determined. And so what does it mean to engage in the gospel from uh, our cultural perceptions of the child. And then another called childhood vulnerabilities. Here they're looking at specific ethical issues that we need to consider. And some have already been in, raised in terms of doing empirical research. How do we really get to these young people uh, in an ethical manner? And there's many topics in this work that explores um, uh, things around child violence, pornography, uh, bullying, cyberbullying and how we go about doing research there. And then lastly, from my side, some of the things we want to kind of explore in this project is one of our colleagues who's a friend of REA is uh, Dave Sinos from Canada. He's a practical theologian who just uh, late last year published the book, Little Theologians. And, and he has also already started reminding us that we need to think about children as theologians. Uh, and so uh, engaging with his concepts and his work, we want to continue the conversation around, even in empirical work, what are the methodologies these little theologians call us to? Uh, so godly play being one of one of them. Yeah. Then lastly, a most recent publication on looking at children's perceptions uh, in terms of the role of biblical narratives in their own spiritual formation. Uh, we know that there are many countless videos of children reciting scripture or preaching on the pulpits uh, going around in social media and TikTok. But what does that essentially mean for the spiritual formation of these children? So I just put out all these questions based on research we've already started digging into and ask, yeah, some of the theoretical and empirical things we need to consider when we say we really engage with the child in our research. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you very much, Chantel. So your work is on engaging children really into the life of the faith community and engaging them also in the, let me say, the, the theological reflection and the theological action that comes out of the life of the community. Thank you very much. It's a very, it's the project is, is like I said, it's, it's trying to be a global project. And the the contextual the contextual elements in it are very important. Like Marine, like uh, Chantal said, the way we look at children is so so uh, different all over the world that we need to talk about this. Well, how they how they really come, uh, how they are considered, and how they come come uh, 
are are let me say are the are the agents in 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 their in their communities. Uh, one specific example of what we're trying to look at is uh, the work of Marina. Marina is doing a um, second book, so-called second book at the University of Bonn, focusing on the didactics of icons in childhood. Marina, the word is the floor is yours. So the topic of my research is uh, the didactics of icons in childhood uh, in the context of the Orthodox religious education. And why did I choose this topic? There are two reasons. The first one is that uh, icons uh, play a very important role in the Orthodox Church and also in the Orthodox religious education. And the reason is, even if Orthodox children uh, are not socialized in the life of the church, have no profound knowledge of faith and uh, religion, they are very familiar with icons. Um, uh, what is icon you see an icon on the screen it's an icon of the mother of god a picture in a church in a monastery in austria europe but you will find in any church all over the world a picture an icon like that and almost uh, almost at every orthodox home uh, image that always referred to an original prototype so an icon of the mother of God refers to her person, to the mother of God herself, and uh, finally to God. Uh, so if the icon is venerated, the person is venerated and God is... The icon uh, does not depict an imagination, but tries to make visible a reality, relationship to God, between human being and God. The citation of Vance, he described icons like windows placed between earthly and heavenly. And uh, it's nice, he, he doesn't write with uh, the icons, the inhabitants of heaven, they are looking at us. So the main aspect of the icon is the relationship between them and themselves. And uh, icons uh, are a visual gospel. What is written? in letters and the gospel is painted in colors on the icons. So the message is the same. Uh, icons, they are really everywhere. At home, you see an icon corner. Uh, it's the place of prayer for the family. Uh, and the church, of course, is a place of prayer, not only in front of the icon, but you see there's no free space on the walls. They are all painted. And uh, we are part of this community of, of persons who are painted there. We are part of, uh, yes, of the prototypes. We are related to them. And uh, also a road. Uh, this is a picture of a patronal feast in Germany. And uh, it's, uh, the place for the feast, uh, they will venerate the icon. Celebrating, dancing, eating, drinking, singing, uh, it's all a common part of life. Uh, but uh, not only children are surrounded by icons, but also icons are surrounded by children. Uh, this is a picture of the Holy and Great Friday. And, and uh, remembering the mirror-bearing woman who went to the temple. Right. And of course, not the tomb is uh, so important, but uh, the person who is in this tomb. And you see an icon of uh, Christ in the tomb, uh, the evangelial and the cross representing himself. So the relation is important. For the life of the world, for the life of the children, for the life of the whole world, in which we are together along the way. So the life of Christ is strong connected to the life of society. And we have to reveal the connection. It's not uh, every day is the Holy and Great Friday uh, around the top of Christ, but indeed around the top, 
But this scene is a very common scene in daily life of Orthodox children. So to approach an icon, to venerate the icon um, is very common. You see, indeed, it's, uh, it's correct. I've written an icon, sees an icon, because their, their main feature is a common feature. Uh, they refer to a common prototype. And uh, a human being is created um, as the image uh, of God and according to his likeness. So whilst the uh, image is a static uh, situation, the image is to be achieved by free will. Mm -hmm. And each icon tells a story. You see here, there's an icon of a saint, but it's on the wall more complicated and uh, you cannot uh, pick it there. This is, if you know the gospel of the resurrection and uh, you have heard about the angel in front of the tomb of Christ, you can read the story of the icon. But there are other icons, there are more. Uh, this is the same topic. The title of the icon is Resurrection. And uh, what is uh, happening there on the icon? Uh, sometimes we need a key to open the message. And you see, um, I've put the song of Easter. This might be one key. And also liturgical texts and uh, uh, customs and the life of the church can open perspectives to understand better the story of an icon. And uh, this is a song really Orthodox children know, even they, if they do not know any other song. Um, but what happens with other icons, which are complicated, and if they do not know the song or the liturgical text, we have to find a key, we have to find an alphabet, how we can read the icons. So this is the most important question. How can we support children to become fluent or more fluent in reading the language of the icons. And uh, because we want to develop uh, of icons and with the help of our children, we, the didactic is for them. And uh, how can we involve children as subjects in our research? And uh, how can this research also take into account children's theological perspective because they are icons, so they have a theological perspective. And uh, please remember these questions for later. And the most important question is what methodology and research formats are appropriate to this goal? To children, but we also listen to them to hear what's going on on their mind. And uh, about life, about life, about uh, how they approach icons and uh, how they approach the stories of icons and if uh, they could play a role in their life. And of course, we know also that even if we talk, also when we approach icons, uh, we are in a tension and we need a balance between a full understanding uh, with accepting that we cannot guess everything in our mind, but at least to guess the message, a message for us and for our lives. This is the main aim of my research. And Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Chantel, for your presentations. So we started with a more general introduction into the research project. Then we looked at the uh, contextual elements. Uh, Chantel was referring to the situation in South Africa and to the, the need for um, the theological, let me say, theological um, self-development, you could say, of children. And Marina was focusing on the on the use of icons in the uh, Orthodox liturgy 
in which children are invited to be part of the story and become part of the story and tell their own story related to the icons and how perhaps also the, the stories of the icons are changed through the interpretation of children. Yeah, How they become part of the stories and how they change the stories perhaps also in new ways, the way they look at the world, the, the way they look at, at their tradition, traditions and so on. Yeah. Uh, of course, there is a lot of contextualization that needs to be done, I think, but that we can't do this this way because uh, it's about it's about uh, orthodox religion in in Germany in a, in a, in a context of uh, of migration and uh, and which is a it's is a huge challenge and a, and a huge a huge um, 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 possibility as well in in changing world so to say these days in what's going on in Europe and in many ways I think we need to uh, we need to take uh, take um, are sure that 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 children are really um, are really taken seriously in in bringing the traditions uh, with the traditions in which they 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 are raised so it's saying they bring with them when they when they travel all around the world and and also in in situations of migration and so on yeah this is a context element we would like now to open the floor i'm still looking i'm looking at the at the, at the watch we still have 18 minutes to go now and um if you want to make connections to the work of robert as well that's fine and I think there are a lot of connections that can be made still, but we were looking at in the chapter project to uh, how can we, which which kind of methodologies can we use to to really listen very carefully to the life of young people and children in this respect, and what what is the the sort of research that we can do with them along with them, so to make them so to say the agents of their own. Theolo theologizing their own way of dealing with the, the, the field of tension between imminence and transcendence in this complex world. What can be the, let, we open out the floor, what can be the, the, the methodological um, um, ways to, to understand them better, to listen more carefully to them and to, and to be sure, and that was what one of us said as well, I think, that we show more than we tell. That was what actually what Robert said. We we sh we show a lot, but we 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 tell a lot. But we should not. We should also show what we mean really when we invite children to become involved. Not only welcomed, but also like uh, Chantal said, also engaged in church, in faith community, and in the and in the learning process in which they are involved. How can we come closer to them? In an in an, of course in an in an uh, inclusive and at the same time responsible way. What are your thoughts to this? Or perhaps you have own experiences in this and, and own, uh, own experiences in, in practice or in, in research in, in dealing with this issue. Whose children are they? And if we listen very carefully to them, uh, um, how can we make them responsible for themselves, so to say, in understanding the, the difficult issues? And how can we help them with our faith traditions in understanding these issues? What do you think? Ellen, Bert, uh, yes, yeah. uh, it, one of the things it seems to me is that um, <laughs> religious education, faith formation, like pastoral care, often is highly dependent on verbalization. Mm -hmm. And if children do not say the things that we're expecting them to say or needing them to say to inform them, Perspective, another avenue to act at. And I wonder if um, the field of play therapy, uh, if there might be some folks who could share some insight from play therapy that would mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, unlock some doors that otherwise might be closed because children may express things in a variety of ways and once i'm 
this is an observation. This is not a clinical insight. <laughs> but once we gain language, it seems we are heavily dependent on language. So, you know, it's sort of use your words. And we do. And we expect others to do the same, but not everybody will or can. And so we have to find a way to retrieve those other modes of communication that also are important um, and not to diminish the power of the word, but there, there are other, I mean, the icons themselves uh, are an example of that. And so how can we access uh, and open ourselves? I, I, I'm hesitant to say access because it's almost as if we're trying to break in to the child's experience or the child's consciousness. And what I'm trying to communicate has more to do with how can we open ourselves to mm -hmm. what they're already telling us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like getting to know your own kids in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's interesting. It's it's not only the case, let me say, in in, in the let me say in the more traditional ways of, of doing faith formation, but also like like Chantel said in the in the in the issues of um of of misuse in congregations in which language is used and language is permanently and and always and over and over again used in 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 the way in the way is talked about God and God images used and so on. So that's the you I think you're completely right. Play therapy could be a way to do to to deal with that complexity. Yeah, in a normal faith set situation you could say but also in in a in a more in, in a more crisis related situation in in fate in fate uh transformation yeah right uh bert i had yeah. um that's chuck speaking hi everybody hey chuck hi good yes, seeing you I, I brought yeah. i brought this up um i brought this up in an earlier session this morning about the importance of uh, children's books that include diversity of cultures and races. And there was a study that was done uh, back in, I believe, the, the 50s or the 60s that showed that children, white children that read stories with black characters uh, would play with black children on the playground more so than children that only read books with white characters in it. Uh, and so it showed the importance of diversity in reading material, and there might be a crossover of children reading about different religious traditions uh, besides racial and culture that would probably have a similar impact. And I just say that given the context in the United States of books being banned regarding diversity and Black history, that would be defeating the purpose that we're seeking of building community and right relationships starting with children uh, mm. children are not born to hate they generally are taught to hate and so who the teachers are of that uh, is needs to be brought to light uh, and whatever that may lead to children being formed in whatever direction they're going and so i would i would suggest that and along with that is just the age appropriate nature of the materials and so uh, Our Lady of Ferguson is a icon, a, a modern icon representing a patron, the patron of victims of gun violence. And children are impacted by gun violence, just like adults. But how that icon is explained, uh, given the many different meanings within it, would, would again call for some age appropriateness as to how that would be explained. So I just I, I offer that I offer the importance of books, children's books with diversity, both RE and secular and um, age appropriateness regarding the explanation of icons. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anybody wants to react? Also relates to to your uh, presentation, Robert, about uh, LGBTQI, uh, the, the, the openness for for diversity issues. And things that should not be talked about, huh? Yeah? Related to the parents who who said, "Well, this is dangerous stuff," or so. Huh? Yeah, I, I wanted to just jump in quickly because um, Chantel, that that idea of of working with with children about violence, um, the the one um, interview 
participant that, that really surprised me was the girl who talked about um, recognizing one of her classmates was being abused at home, um, really wanting to do something about it, seeing that as an act of kindness. But because of her own experience in foster care, choosing not to tell an adult about it because it was a 50-50 coin flip as to you know, how difficult that would be. Without diminishing the role of, of CPS services, or uh, it, it's interesting because, um, like you were saying, um, Alan, in terms of we don't want to access or draw out of them, how do we let the the children set some of the parameters of of how they actually will will want to communicate this? That to me seems one of the most problematic things about an adult trying to do research with kids when there's trauma and things that they may not want to talk about with adults. How much can they be involved in saying, this is what we need, we want to talk about it, but this is what we need to be able to talk about it and to move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was looking at, uh, at the chats. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of him, a lot of interventions and, and people are thinking along. So just briefly to say that this chapter project is just very preliminary. preliminary. It's, it's really a, pro, a first step, so to say, in the project. And we didn't get funding for it yet. So we're just trying to find out who is involved in this kind of work and who wants to join us in a way. So that's actually what we are dealing with at this time of, of the of the project, so to say. Age group is 10 to 12 years old. Yeah. Some of the questions are, Robert, for you, if you could have a look at them, perhaps you could respond to the people who have asked the question. Uh, some have had to leave the room as well, send me a personal message, but okay, this is a, 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 a format that it's really, really um, all the time on the move, so to say. But there is Henry going on, and Henry wants to raise a question. Henry, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, I wanted to address just as far as like methodologically of like including children. I mean, it's, I mean, in a lot of research that I've come across, with and in working with children, including children in research, whether it's theological or other types, is a lot of times we end up doing this like one on one with children, like we interview individual children at a time. And what mm -hmm. I found in my research and what I've done in some of the research projects I've done is, and it's it's messy and it's hard to do, but like to do groups of children um, because then you're and making sure you're recording it and stuff that the transcription is very messy with it. Because then you you get a chance to allow the children to interact with each other, um, and they're creating meaning with each other, and they're like, I've, because I've, I've run into things where I've like had a child, like, I, and and then mixing in visual methods with them and having children talk about their pictures, talk about their pictures with others. Mm -hmm. um, Marina, I'm like fascinated by what's going to come out of your research with the icons and children speaking into that and back and forth. Um, but I just wonder, like, of having groups of children, like, talk around these visual things um, and exchanging me meanings with each other, reinforcing meanings, transforming meanings with each other. Um, I'm pulling from William Corsero's work in his, um, how he um, talked about how children create meaning. Um, and I found that fruitful when I'm trying to get the voices of children, because I'm a, I'm a trying to step back a little bit and allowing them to talk and recording it, but then going back and then using how they talk with each other to discern what they're saying, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Henry. That, that's helpful, helpful in the research of Marina, but also helpful for the projects. So I'd say always look how, how children uh, come together in, in understanding uh, uh, what what they experience in in faith formation and in and in the uh, and in the life you could say of of uh, of today, Shola, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, still on the icons. Um, I was mm -hmm. just wondering how you'll be able to get really original ideas of children about the pictures on the icons. The, I, I guess the icons are like illustrations from what I saw. So I was just wondering how do they, how will you be able to differentiate what are their original thoughts from what society has helped them to believe? Cause like by age 10, 12, things parents have said, 
uh, they have learned in their different faith traditions are like most likely what they would give back like oh this picture is this that picture is that how will you be able to differentiate between what they really think about a picture and what they have been helped to see a picture re represents or means um a younger age may be a bit more difficult, but I remember what makes me ask this question is when one of our daughters was three, she's well over 20 now, but I remember her looking at a picture representing baby Jesus, the icon with the halo on the head, and she started crying and saying, oh, what happened to him? Did he bump his head on something? His head is bigger than the rest of the body and all that. And I could see an authentic, I mean, that was her own interpretation of the picture but then go down the line to age 10 12 she's like able to tell me oh this is what this means that's what that means because she has been told over and over she's seen that in church and pictures and all that so i'm just wondering how will you be able to draw the line thank you yeah we need to slowly but surely we need to we need to wrap up the session it's going so fast marina can you can we respond in one sentence and then chantel i would like i would like to say you have the final word for for our session and then we need to dear friends you saw also that you need to to uh to fill in the evaluation form is that possible at the same time we need to need to do a lot of multitasking here marina yes i'll answer very briefly um so I'm not sure if they really know so many things about icons that are familiar to them, uh, but uh, they cannot read the stories. Uh, and this is the question, how can they read the story? And I don't think that uh, they have uh, so much support from the family or from the school or from the church to read the story. So I think this is their part, their contribution uh, to this uh, project and uh, also uh, I'm not sure if it's necessary to draw a very clear line because I've uh, learned maybe in family, it's also part of their life. Uh, and of course they have to develop further, but I would not separate so very clear, a very clear cut, but to examine what comes from the family, what does it mean for them? And maybe do they have some further ideas? Uh, they are already ten, 10 years old, so they have an own opinion. I'm not sure if they are still at the stage uh, of what the family told me is uh, the only thing that exists. So I think uh, it can, uh, perspective can help the other perspective together. It will be a good, a fruitful. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Chantel, um, I'm looking now at the clock because there will be a next session. Please don't forget to fill in the feedback form. Uh, Chantel, can you, can you, um, you had a question or you had an, uh, an observation and then you have the final word. It's up to you. Yeah, no, I mean, thanks so much for all the input. Um, you know, I think we all realize that this could also be termed an academic suicidal project because uh, if you really engage with, for example, the praxis cycle, it's it's a long journey of immersion, reflection, uh, input, and so forth. And so in a global community, which this project is bringing together, we are literally still having to figure out core concepts. So there was already a question in the chat around how are we going to bring this together in terms of the different contextual realities? Um, but that's that's exactly the challenge of really being intentional about it, taking the long haul and really engaging and immersing ourselves in the research. So, I mean, I think a lot of people would assume that academic suicide because it's not going to, the results won't come out immediately. I do just want to appreciate Karen's comment, um, Karen Marie's comment on the developmental stages. I think one of mm -hmm. my challenges with those stages is that it is just developmental. I prefer terms around formation because formation itself too, like the immersive research process takes time. It takes cycles of engaging and uh, checking and clarifying, not only with the kids we engage with across the globe, but as researchers. So we're literally taking a risk to say, what are we learning in our different contexts and what are we learning about each other as we do this research? And that, that's really 
the call for this project, um, not to start new forms of research altogether, but to literally reflect on how we are engaging and what we are learning as academics, as adults, from the research processes with children. And that in itself is going to take time. So unfortunately, you may see us here at about five other REA conferences uh, coming to ask some more questions, but that's what most of us don't want to engage in because of the academic environments we find ourselves in, which says publish or perish. So we're basically saying, yeah, let's let's just journey and see what we learn from, from the kids, from our context, from each other's context and my methodologies. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Chantal, for this final observation. I do I completely uh, agree with you. It's really about how we how we look anew to children and how we look anew to the local to local uh, context of children, uh, and not from let me say from adultist perspectives or or the ways we look as academics to to this to this uh, world of of development of change and of and of uh, longing. You could say huh? in the many ways, yeah. So, dear friends, I think we need to we need to uh, we need to wrap up now this session. Uh, it was really uh, very intensive, a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, um, a lot of stuff also that can be read. So please check check along again the chat for one moment, and then we wrap up. And just click quickly on on the on the things that you could that you could then. Uh, um, um, keep for yourself and 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 check out later because I think really there are so so many helpful resources going going coming together in this kind of in this kind of sessions that 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 are that we take along uh, from this table of learning. Thank you very much. It was good to work with you. Thank you very much from our side, from Robert's side, Marina's, Chantel's, and my side. Um, have a great conversation, uh, ongoing conversation in this in this beautiful REA conference and looking forward to seeing you again soon um, on Zoom, okay? But uh, I think in presence would be great as well. See you, bye-bye. <laughs>